Thank you all for coming. My name is Dr. Jordan Moore, a uh, chiropractor for everyone watching online. Um, and today we're doing a workshop about spine-wise exercise. And uh, instead of like what you should be doing in the gym and stuff, it's, it's more focused around um, kind of how your muscle imbalances occur, sitting at a desk all the time and uh, basically how we can counteract that. And uh, we'll also talk about in the gym um, some issues we see, uh, people doing it like the squat rack and bench press, things that, that everyone really does, and unless you draw attention to it, you're not going to correct it. But uh, first off, how working parents spend an average weekday. Um, this was a study, I think, I can't remember if it was Vox that put this out, but uh, the hours per day in selected activities um, for parents aged 25 to 54 with children under the age of 18. So it's a little specific, but uh, still, it shows the average American spends most time, most of the time working and sleeping. Um, the third biggest category is leisure and sports, but once we dive into that, we see leisure and sports is pretty much watching TV um, <laughs> and socializing, so probably going to bars and stuff. But sports, exercise, and recreation is usually 18 minutes a day for American, uh, which surprised me, it's actually a little more than I thought. Um, but yeah, so that's 80% of our day, each and every day, uh, basically in bad posture unless you're sitting there like always aware drawing the shoulders back pulling the head up which realistically nobody does um, so we're going to talk about correct posture and then also having a workout regimen to uh, correct the muscle dysfunctions that we get from sitting at this <coughs> so um, here we are so basically what we see from sitting at a desk usually our pecs tend to tighten, we slouch forward, um, our head comes up to look at the screen in front of us, and what we get is a stretching of the neck flexors, the deep muscles here in the neck. Um, we're also stretching the rhomboids, <coughs> the shoulder blades here, and from tight pecs and tight upper traps. So basically your muscle is not at its full length when you're contracted, when you're staring at the desk or uh, the computer screen. And so as a result, the muscle that has the opposing action um, which are the rhomboids here for the pecs, will stretch, constantly stretch. And that's 80% of your day, each and every day. Um, so pretty much that muscle will tend to get weaker, the pecs will get over-facilitated is what it's called, not necessarily stronger. So we got to start planning an exercise um, pattern or regime to counteract that. But um, the two biggest things here were the tight pecs, tight upper traps, and the later scap, which is the muscle that just pulls the scapula up. Um, we got upper cross and we got lower cross. So, um, lower cross, also sitting in a chair too long, um, tend to get weak glutes and weak abdominal muscles. Um, we have an over-facilitated erector spinae, it's just the muscles in the deep back, and uh, also tight hip flexors. And a thing about uh, upper cross, let me go back. When I was in high school, in the weightlifting program there with... Uh, it was for soccer, so everyone had to lift weights, baseball players, football players. Um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'd have the same workouts. We would do squats, we would do bench press, and we would do hang cleans, which is you'd pick up a weight and put it on your chest and stand up and drop it again. Uh, we did not work rhomboids once. Um, obviously nothing for the neck. We just over-facilitated ourselves for muscles that we were already using too much in class. And uh, that's a huge issue. Uh, setting yourself up for injury. Never once did we do anything for uh, hip flexors or it was always all quads, pecs, and uh, deltoids back in high school. And that was our high school telling us to do that. <coughs> um, I feel like a lot of things haven't changed since then. And I, I bet if you were to ask someone in high school what weights they're doing, they're probably just doing those three power groups is what they're called. But um, we're going to talk about what to do for all these facilitated and inhibited muscles here and uh, yeah some other issues that we see so a big thing with this the tight hip flexors um, you have a muscle called the uh, iliacus and iliacus and psoas major together it's the iliopsoas they go from the front of the lumbar spine into your hip 
And if you have it tighter on one side, it tends to raise the entire hip complex mm -hmm. up toward that uh, side. As a result, you see people like uh, bending over, picking weeds in the garden, you'll feel a pop, they'll have that on the same side where that tight so as is, they'll have a disc herniation. Because yeah. that muscle is attached to the disc. But um, some basics here, movement is life. So whether you're a tree, you're an animal, a human, you need movement to live. Nutrients, um, uh, microscopic levels, so like with a plant, it'd be like an apical meristem, I think that's what it's called. But uh, transaction of nutrients and stuff like that has to occur. Uh, for me, one of the most important reasons for movement is the skeletal muscle pump. So with gravity, let's think about the heart. The heart pumps blood at enormous pressure down through the uh, arteries, arterioles, into the uh, capillaries. From there, the ven um, venules will pick it up into the veins, and you need a way for the blood to get back up to the heart. And it's not going to be just blood pressure that does it. It's going to have to be movement. It's going to have to be um, this thing. In the calf, you have a sap and a vein. That you need the calf movement of the soleus and gastroc to pump that blood up back toward the heart. And uh, you see a lot of sedentary lifestyles tend to involve um, like spider veins and varicose veins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's just an issue with getting the blood back out there. It's venous insufficiency is what it's called. Uh, another thing, some basics here. It's the kinetic chain. So in order, going up the spine or down the spine, you have a stable joint and then a mobile joint. <clears throat> so um, with this, if you have an issue on any part of the chain, it'll likely cause dysfunction somewhere else along the chain. So if you had lack of mobility here in the ankles and you've made the foot, um, let's think over pronate, so I have to turn out to accompany that, you're also going to have the knee. So let's think foot turning out, you're going to have the knee more pressure on the middle because of the femur to come in. You're going to have a tight mm -hmm. tensor fascia lata and uh, IT band. And unless that first issue, which is the primary problem there, the ankle, is addressed, um, you're setting yourself up for failure. There's going to be a lot of issues there. And uh, once again, another thing with the weak rhomboids and tight pecs, um, when the shoulder comes up forward and pulls the uh, scapula with it, it tends to make the glenohumeral joint, which is where the uh, humerus goes into, um, become shallower. And unless you can start tightening those rhomboids together, uh, you're going to have a shallow GH joint is what it's called and predisposed to stuff like dislocations and uh, ligament tears there. All right, so current exercise routines. Uh, most people at the gym, you'll see hitting the heavy stuff or sitting at a sedentary machine where it's just one motion over and over again. Um, remember back in high school and college, because I didn't know better then either, we'd have a, uh, like a leg day and like Monday would be like chest day, you know, just working that one muscle over and over. Um, not practical for if you want to prevent injury and undo lifestyle um, disorders in this case. You need to really uh, involve all the joints that you would need to like, let's say you're picking up something, you know, instead of leaning at the back to pick it up, which is what everyone wants to do. Our uh, bodies typically want to preserve as much energy as possible instead of do what's most biomechanically sound. Um, you should be hinging at the hips, bending at the knees, kicking a straight back to pick something up. But that's not what we're doing in the gym. We're not training ourselves to do that. Um, we should be. Uh, if you can't do a proper squat, you should be putting 500 pounds on a bar <laughs> and coming up with it. Um, so a lot of things, loss of range of motion and focus on appearances over functionality in the gym. Um, a lot of people like to work chest, thighs, quads, take a three big ones, shoulders. Uh, everyone likes to look at those. But um, I'm trying to think, a, a Cybex machine or one of the life fitness if you get a club for um, I was looking at it the other day, it just has the bicep come and you just curl away. But uh, a lot of this don't take into account the action of the bicep. It's actually, it, it does flex the arm, but they're missing, it, it's supposed to supinate the arm as well. Which, if you train the bicep away from its original intention, so if you're going to teach the bicep just to do this and you're going to lose the supination, you're going to mess up, it's called the antagonist, you have for every um, primary mover, which would be a bicep. You have antagonist, the tricep. 
So uh, for every muscle, you have another one like the pec and the rhomboid like we were talking about earlier. Uh, you want to do the full range of motion in an exercise and not lose range of motion any other way because if you ever need to do the full range of the bicep, lifting something or um, you know carrying something, pulling it out, you will tweak it. I mean, you've never used that before. You've gone to the gym, you've, you've got really strong arms, but you've lost that supination there. So uh, functional exercises as opposed to isolationist ones and... Like I said earlier, uh, stress ourselves in the directions of everyday activities. So, two laws, Wolf's Law came earlier and Davis has followed. Wolf's Law is if you stress a bone in a certain direction, the uh, body will actually lay down something called hydroxyapatite, and it's uh, basically preformed bone. It'll start stacking out more bone in that area and uh, strengthening. So, think about like Muay Thai fighters <laughs> kicking a banana tree, stuff like that. Um, Basically, Davis's law is a corollary of Wolf's law. So, ligaments. If you start stressing your ligaments in the direction that you want to strengthen them, they'll become uh, stronger unless you just tweak it too much and, and tear it. I've torn a few. But, uh, so if you need to start teaching these high schoolers and like, let's say soccer players, strengthen the ACL, MCL, meniscus, uh, address that instead of just getting them big, you know, big quads and stuff. But, uh, same for us. If we have an issue, say a shoulder issue, um, you can start deepening that joint and addressing yourself in the direction of, you know, whatever pain or whatever instability you already have. Um, so, uh, the more you do so, something... Uh -huh. Can I ask a question? So, what about whenever, um, like, whenever I had my second trial um, and I lost all ab all abs. Um, <laughs> I had really bad like lower back problems yeah. and they told me to that I needed to do um, like I need to strengthen my core uh, because it would support better support my back. Is yeah. that kind of the same thing? Is that kind of sort of like? Yeah. Um, what did, did they tell you a certain way to do it? Or no. Just but they just said yeah you need to strengthen your core. It'll help your back. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so is that, I mean, is that kind of like the same thing or is that like totally? Well, if you have a weak core, you probably have an over facilitated low back, which is lower cross syndrome, but um, okay. you're just right after having a kid. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like probably that could have been anything. four months yeah. after. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's true, but I was just wondering if the, the, the core muscles had any effect on the, the back. Oh yeah, absolutely. like a bit correlated. Okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what helps us fight gravity the most. That and the low okay. back muscles. Mm -hmm. But um, going back to uh, like in the gym, talking about or, or bending over, picking something up. The more you do that, the more it gets ingrained in your brain. Uh, you're training your brain to to do this every time you need to do that motion. So if you're bending over, picking stuff up, flexion in the back, which is not supposed to happen that much, but if you're doing that day in and day out, and you're either a laborer or doing something out of the normal, picking something heavy up, moving, um, you're going to stress it real bad, and it's not used to it, and it's not meant to move that way. So your lumbar vertebrae will actually, they're, they're not meant to go forward that much, and they'll shear against each other. And uh, you'll also lose your, lose your lumbar curve as well. Um, when I started as a patient here in the 14, 13, 2013, uh, all I had done was what they told me to do in the gym. And I had a negative curve in my low back. It was like negative 13, so it's going the wrong way. And uh, it, it, it's from that. It's from the gym routines they put us through. And uh, thankfully, we got it back. But if you teach your body to do a defaulting movement pattern, it'll start becoming normal. Anyways, um, so as we get older, we tend to lose uh, the natural movements that we were given at birth. Um, you can see here, this is a child, and he's squatting to pick something up. This is what you should look like. Uh, maybe less exaggerated. <laughs> but <That's from> <laughs> we should have this straight back, head in neutral position, flexion at the hips, knees, and the ankle mobility, which for me, that's my biggest issue. Uh, if you lose that ankle mobility, it'll throw everything off, um, in my case. But there are ways to train it and get it back. So we are what we repeatedly do. Um, Will Durant was summarizing Aristotle's philosophy of the story of philosophy. Uh, the more you do something, you'll become it, basically, I guess. So 
we need to train these body movements to become part of our everyday life. Uh, don't let gravity win. So, um, teaching our body to be upright against gravity is extremely important. Um, if we have some forward head posture, we have some, uh, like, sitting at a desk and we're slumped forward, we're going to cause that upper cross syndrome, but further exacerbate it, so to speak. Um, if you think of a better way to put this, uh, if you're walking and you have forward head posture, every bounce you take is going to be further pushing you into that position more and more and more. And uh, the spine isn't just, it's not just your neck. Everything's connected, like we saw in the kinetic chain. Every single joint's going to be somehow tweaked, somehow not in the proper posture that it should be. Um, interesting study here. Um, the effects of heavy smartphone use on the cervical angle pain threshold of neck muscles and depression, um, like psychological depression. They found in a small study, it was 20 people, 10 people that were, um, excuse me, had a smartphone addiction proneness and uh, 10 people in the control group. Both were assessed for pain along the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the people who used their phone a lot actually had higher pain in the muscle belly. And uh, oddly enough, they also found that the people who use their phone more often, whether or not it's structurally based or not, um, suffered depression more than the, uh, than the control group. So I thought that was really interesting to put in here. But um, yeah, we don't know if that's because their phone's making them depressed or because they're looking down. But we're in the 5G. Or the 5G. <laughs> Very well. Sorry. Uh, but if you're going to use your phone, don't use 5G. <laughs> Pick it up to look at it. Yeah. Don't be doing this. Pick it up. <clears throat> so, before you begin, do any, any of these exercises to kind of counter, uh, kind of undo um, bad posture. Breathing techniques. Breathing, breathing, breathing. So, in a study here in 2011, mouth breathing was linked to forward head posture. Um, so they found people breathing with their mouth would have to change their biomechanics and push their head forward. I said to move the highway bone out of the way and uh, open up, it was the retrotracheal airspace. But the people who breathed in through their nose, they, they didn't have to do that. They had fine posture the way it was. So if you're gonna be doing the exercises, um, we need to be breathing in through our nose, out through our mouth if you want. Um, another interesting thing was for every inch of forward head posture, or, uh, yeah, for every inch of forward head posture, you have 10 more pounds of pressure on the head. And the head should already weigh uh, 10 to 18 pounds, depending on your size and everything. But we've had patients with two and a half, three inches of forward head posture. That's 35, 40 pounds wow. on the head. Um, also, one other thing. In another study, I think it's in the footnote on this slide, uh, forward head posture was linked to 30% reduction in vital lung capacity. So that's total inspiratory and total exp expiratory volume of the lung. So keeping that, uh, breathing in through the nose and out the mouth is extremely important. Um, discuss this, many exercises in the gym involve the same action over and over. Um, my biggest problem isn't with these machines, it's with them not addressing the full range of motion of a muscle. Um, they, like the, the, the issue with the bicep machine, it should be doing supination as well, not just over and over pulling up on the thing. But uh, another thing is people that can squat 500 plus pounds and you know they're really strong, can't stand on one leg and do a one-legged squat um, <laughs> without falling over, even just a little bit, because they have weak stabilizing muscles in the legs. But let me put it that I'm not against squats. Um, <laughs> Just make sure you do stabilizing exercises as well. So sit-ups and crunches. Um, they were a gold standard for a while in a lot of middle school and high school fitness tests, but uh, they've been phased out here. Um, the U.S. Army is actually phasing out sit-ups from its Army phys physical test uh, because they can be harmful and there are better ways of strengthening the core. And if you think about the position that people are in to do a sit-up, you know, with knees bent or whatever on their back, coming forward, a lot of the motion's here. And that's hip flexion. That's not your core. Um, 
and the hip flexion are those already facilitated muscles from earlier at the lower cross syndrome, which uh, the psoas, iliacus, don't need to be worked out anymore than they are. They don't need to be stretched. They need to be stretched. But uh, from, from sit-ups and crunches, spine can become injured. Hip flexors, like the psoas, over facilitated. Lumbar vertebra, vertebra actually get sheared together, and the deep back muscles are stretched with little to no benefit. <clears throat> so one more thing with squatting. Um, most people can't maintain a proper squat position because of how they're thinking of what a squat should be. So I remember in high school, um, three days a week, the squatting or the gym instructor would always say, go as low as you can, low as you can, low as you can. But at that low of a squat, we have something, what's called a butt link. Uh, <laughs> literally, the butt just tucks down. It's called counter nutation of the sacrum. And what that is, is uh, that puts the lumbar <laughs> spine into flexion, which is, once again, that motion we don't need to be doing. If you can keep an upright back, upright torso, and keep the head neutral, um, great. I think the squat's an ex excellent exercise for, uh, for core strength and just overall um, functional fitness. I have a question about squats. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend <clears throat> lunges or squats to be safer for knees and ankles that have been torn up from soccer? From soccer? Yeah. Probably lunges. Okay. We'll talk about that later. Lunges okay. actually stretch your psoas as well. Um, not weighted yet. Not just weighted. body weight. Just body weight. Yeah. That, those, that, they're probably fine to go either way. So lunges, you'll put more on one leg at a time. And squats, if you go together, it'll be... Yeah. Split between the two. Okay. Both of them hurt though? Uh, the squats do, they hurt my ankles because I, I broke one and tore the other one all the pieces. Yeah. Turf. Yeah, I love it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to be doing squats, let's make sure we can do them properly. Uh, so there's a grading system called FMS, it's functional movement screen or functional movement systems. Uh, they have three or four really ratings for your movement of actually performing a squat. And I linked at the end of this presentation their website, but it shows you this is perfect. You should be able to do a squat, hands over the head, holding a dowel. Um, you can see straight through the back, straight through the torso, perfect. Uh, if you can't do that, which I'm in this two category here, if I'm leaning forward and you have loss of range of motion through the ankles there, you need to elevate the back of the ankle. Once you do that, if you can get it perfectly, you know your issues in the ankles, which for me it is. Um, if you can't do that, then you're rated a three. If you have any, or a one, if you have any pain at all, you use a zero and you stop the test. So <laughs> I'll link, it's, it's linked in here. You can actually go to their website and see all the different exercises to see if you're uh, functionally fit, so to speak. But once again, it is a wonderful exercise if done properly. <clears throat> so. Putting it together, beginning your workout plan, um, make sure you have the breathing first off, and focus on exercises that encourage the body to correct the postural deviations that we talked about in upper and lower cross syndrome. Um, the 80% of your day that you spend, uh, well, average Americans probably a little better, but uh, at a desk or whatever, you need to be mindful of your posture. Um, so you won't have much as much work to do to actually correct these dysfunctions. Um, so, we're going to incorporate more exercises that retrain our bodies to become efficient, uh, as well as biomechanically sound. And one thing I want to point out, these exercises are going to be more neurologically demanding than physically. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to be doing these exercises to the point of exhaustion. They need to be to the point where you can't have proper form anymore. Upper cross syndrome. A list of every muscle that gets short and length. Um, the best way to put this... Uh, if you think about the posture that is involved with upper cross syndrome, so leaning forward with the head, uh, tight pecs, it, if you learn the muscles, you can learn which ones are, are pretty much need to be undone. Um, so the posture just needs to be taken back, head lifted, shoulders pulled back, and that pretty much knocks out uh, half of these muscles here. But um, on the next page, great posture here. We need to do stretching of these tight muscles. So. Um, let's see, 
with this position here, and he needs to drop his head off the end of the foam roll uh, and turn it for the sternocleidomastoids as well, you can stretch the muscles that become shortened sitting at a desk. So it's pretty much just doing the opposite of what you would be doing at a desk. <coughs> um, only thing with this picture, if he, so the rotator cuff here, if he had his arms up and back, we'd be uh, stretching Terry's, um, or sorry, subscapularis, and also uh, lengthening the Terry's minor and infraspinatus. But, uh, great position here. I would stretch before starting to uh, tighten up the lengthened muscles. So, definitely lay on this thing 15 minutes a day. Um, yeah, before you start actually going through the exercises. So, uh, besides keeping good posture, which everyone knows posture for the head, it's um, if you jut your head forward, bring it all the way back so you kind of get a double chin, <laughs> and then think if there's balloons on your head sort of lifting up. So from here, act like they're pulling the head up. It's maybe not be flattering through here, but <laughs> another thing is pull the shoulders all the way back and just kind of relax, and that's good. And um, that is actually really hard to do if you're not used to doing it a lot, but needs to be done as much as possible. Um, so this guy's doing a rhomboid squeeze, squeezing the two shoulder blades together. These are those muscles that need to be worked out there. Excuse me. Um, one thing you could add here, if you didn't have any history of dislocations in the shoulders, actually pick the arms up and squeeze them together. Um, like I said, don't do it until you're tired. Do it until you can't have proper posture. Externally rotated shoulders and bringing those two together. <laughs> so next is uh, lower cross, shortened and lengthened muscles. Um, we have the hip flexor complex, which is what we were talking about, the psoas, iliacus. We have the gastrox and soleus on the back of the leg, um, adductors through the middle part of the femur and you can see lats is actually on both lower and upper cross because it, it reaches all the way from down here to the um, bottom of the cervicals. It's got, I can't remember the name, it's, a, it's called an aponeurosis but the muscle pretty much becomes a giant tendinous sheath on the back of the uh, spine and everything. But those are your shortened and these are your lengthened. So the lengthened ones will be on the opposite side of the shortened. So gastroc soleus back of the leg tibialis anterior and posterior on the front of the leg. Um, so we've got to find a balance between those as well. <coughs> so here's five uh, stretches I found online that I really like to counteract the uh, muscle imbalances of upper and lower cross syndrome. First one's called Brugger, Brugger stretch. So you're going to sit up, externally rotate those shoulders, and uh, have good posture with the head. You can actually do A and B together. That's working the deep cervical flexors. Um, you're not actually going to be touching your chin, just pulling it down <laughs> to work those muscles there. <laughs> so, I mean, you can if you touch it. I don't know why it's touching, but you can work those muscles. <laughs> What's the <thicker? laughs> um, Next is one of my favorites a lunge. A uh, few things there you can do ankle mobility, knee just needs to touch lightly on the ground. Um, it's going to stretch the psoas of the leg that's on the ground, and as you raise, it'll get the um, tibialis anterior posterior and also the quads of the opposite leg. So you're doing both sides at once. Um, once you get good at that, I'd recommend uh, throwing upper cross syndrome into the mix. So on the leg that you're not using your quad, like maybe lift an arm or take a weight like a kettlebell, raise it as you're going down, switch arms, the other one. Um, another stretch is the pec stretch. So you're just going to grab your hands behind and just pull back on the shoulders. And it'll lengthen through the... And the last one, everyone's seen that, just a basic one. Yes. Have you ever heard of the couch stretch? The what? Couch stretch? <laughs> oh. No, no, you, no, it's really like the thing. Oh, no. You basically... You've never heard of it? Right, you put up on the, knee, on the wall. Yeah. Basically like a lunge, but you're... Your butt on the couch? You, yeah. Well, no, you're... Butts in the air. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a pass. Why don't you demonstrate, Phil? I don't want that Kevin. <laughs> 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 Do you need a couch for it? I need mean, no, a wall. No, I need a wall on the floor. Oh, yeah. Show me that. 
Yeah. Show everyone. I will. I was thinking you were making a joke like that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> 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 That's like a real thing. I can't buy exercise. So here's a great exercise. Um, one that I personally love because once, uh, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm just have a. If you're able to slowly lower yourself down, keeping a neutral spine on, you can do this anywhere, on any step anywhere. Uh, you're going to train yourself to have balance. You see, he's not actually touching the ground, but stopping short and raising himself back up. Um, this is a wonderful, to, wonderful exercise to do. Um, it's it's neurologically you can catch yourself if you're slipping. You can you'll just have that strength in that one leg to to not have to rely on both if you are uh, if you're misstepping or something like that. Um, so yeah, the only thing I don't like about this guy is at the very end you can see it kind of gets a little unstable there. But once you've mastered this one, uh, in his right arm, I would recommend him take a kettlebell. Yeah, and so. Everyone's seen a kettlebell, yes? So it's got the, the ring and then the weight. Um, take like maybe a five, 10 pound kettlebell. And we're not necessarily trying to press, we're trying to hold the kettlebell so the ball's in the air. So it's a stability thing. Uh -huh. So it'll be a balance between the flexors and extensors through the wrist as well as the shoulder pressing it up. Um, that would be incredible for this guy if he could get that point. <laughs> he probably is, he's just showing us. Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing about lower cross syndrome, High heels, and I try to make it for guys too, or boots with the heels raised, but mostly women. Uh, they, high heels should be avoided. Um, I mean, it's 2019, you don't know guys these days. <laughs> but what these high heels do is, is approximate the origin and insertion of the gastroc and soleus muscles. And overall, it's going to further contribute to them being sh even further shortened. Uh, it's going to put more pressure on the heels as well. It's actually a really cool study um, linking knee osteoarthritis in high-heeled shoes. Mm. So because of the increased pressure and, and altered joint mechanics, um, these women were actually ending up with uh, OA or osteoarthritis of the medial compartment of the knee. And I think when I read osteoarthritis affects women two times more than men, it's two to one. And uh, basically that's why they did the study, seeing if it was because of high heels or not. But I'm not gonna sit here and tell you not to wear them because I know <laughs> You still will, but, uh, you know, if you're going to, to work every day in high heels, maybe turn it down a little bit or, you know, maybe not as much. But, um, once again, stretching those hip flexors uh, as well as strengthening glutes um, through the lunge is extremely important for you. So, I got a film. I don't know if it's easy to see. Um, I'll just tell you about it. We got the left. This is called the iliac crest, top of the bone here. And then the right iliac crest, and then uh, pretty much a straight spine through the front. So this is viewed from the front to back. Um, and the reason I put this in here is it, you can't really see muscles in an x-ray. But you can kind of see a white band here and a white band here. That's the psoas. That's the uh, muscle that goes from the front of these as well as the disc down into the femur, which I believe it's the lesser trochanter, which is in there in the femur. <coughs> And because this person has a raised left hip, I would recommend them, um, let's say when we're doing lunges on the right side, pulling that left psoas because it's already over facilitated and pulling up that hip, add a twist to it. So you want to stretch that one a little more. Uh, maybe try to get more of a neutral pelvic angle there. Uh, that's not too, too bad. We've seen patients with worse. But yes, they would, they would add a twist at the bottom of that lunge there. So it goes through the pelvis and to the back of the femur? Is that? Um, it passes anterior, so it's in front. Okay. And on the right side, um, fun fact, the psoas is actually a good orthopedic test if you think someone has, well, don't do it, but if someone has, um, <laughs> what is it, appendicitis, uh, a lot of times doctors will have them try to use that psoas and push down on it. And since it touches the um, appendix, if they have a rupture oh. or any inflammation, it's excruciatingly painful. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah, it runs through um, front of those lumbar discs and kind of makes its way superior um, to the medial femur there. <clears throat> so, two exercises I love um, for doing for working out the core: quadruped and dead bug. If anyone's ever 
been to yoga. Um, you might have done uh, quadruped on the top. But these work on core stabilization while reinforcing proper spinal alignment. So you're basically trying to keep yourself from twisting and turning too much. Um, it does look kind of funny, doesn't it? <laughs> Just the word dead bug. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the bottom one. Right. <laughs> so these two exercises are um, known as what's called working out in a cross-crawl pattern. So we're going to do the left upper limb, right lower, or vice versa, right upper, left lower. And or you could just basically crawl like a baby, which to me is extremely important. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, um, even though I look kind of crazy in Petrol Park, are cross crawling and strengthening these contralateral uh, neuromuscular cross linkages is what they call them. It's telling the left and right brain to work together. That's pretty much all this. Um, babies actually move in a homolateral pattern, so they're doing right arm, right leg until they develop those linkages. and. Um, as they strengthen them, they can get up and go, start moving a lot faster. But this linkage actually occurs uh, once they start crawling. Right arm, left leg, left arm, right leg. And that's what a lot of doctors look for as they develop. We tend to lose that as we get older. And uh, when I first started doing crawls, it was very tough. It was very tough. And like I said, we're not doing it to get tired. We're doing it to train our brain to, to move like that again, so to speak. And. Uh, Definitely a good one to do once you master going forward, start going backwards, side to side with the crawl. Just make sure you keep that um, moving right arm, left leg, and vice versa. <clears throat> so, video of a guy crawling in place. <laughs> um, he's, he's, ideally, you, you want to go forward or backwards, or uh, he's just showing us what to do. But literally, the only moving video or moving picture I could find was this guy. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, notice the right arm works with the left leg and vice versa. He's keeping neutral spine through here. Ideally I'd like for him to pick up his head so we can see where he's going, if he's actually crawling just like a baby would. And uh, core should be engaged at all times. So keep that core tight as you're doing So things to remember. Um, Avoiding exercises that will put you in a state of this dysfunction because you're going to become um, what you repeatedly do. So if you're going to be moving incorrectly or, or using one side more than the other, let's say carrying a backpack on one side, it's, you're going to have tighter on that side. You're going to be doing things incorrectly uh, according to what your body should be doing. But proper posture during sleeping and desk work as well as becoming more active. And like I said, we should be doing those functional exercises uh, more so than trying to you know, work out the same three over and over and over. Um, picking up your cell phone, extremely important. Keep breathing in mind at all times. Um, excuse me. And if you got any questions, uh, let me know. Does anyone have any right now? If you, um, in the gym and you're doing biceps, you know, I'm thinking about when you were talking about the biceps and triceps. Um, it's important to work the triceps as, as much as the biceps? Yes. Because they're opposing muscles? Um, I wouldn't do it immediately yeah. after. Okay. But, yeah, since it is an antagonist to it, so every muscle is a primary mover, uh -huh. depending on the action, an antagonist and a synergist. Okay. So, in that case, you have the bicep, primary mover. Uh -huh. Tricep is the antagonist, it opposes it, so as mm -hmm. the bicep contracts, it lengthens. Mm -hmm. And then the synergist, which kind of helps the movement, is the uh, brachioradialis. Okay. So, we just need to, if you were going to do biceps, mm -hmm. um, I try to make it more functional. So stand on one leg opposite of the bicep that you're going to do, and then you're going to take it and go through the full range of motion supination. This requires them. balance as well with me. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Let's, it's, That's it's fine. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, is weights over machine, is there any advantage as to doing weights Free over weights machine? Free weights and dumbbells. Yes. Yeah, over the machine, machine doing it? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, you'll have to use your stabilizers okay. to keep yourself from dropping the weight somewhere on a machine. It's pretty much guiding you through that one motion. Okay. You know? um, and you, if you have to catch yourself and kind of like keep yourself from falling over, mm -hmm. um, that's great. That's yeah. You're training those little muscles. <laughs> All right. As long as you don't, you don't tweak yourself, you know, don't be doing too much that you should be. And you were saying when the hips are uneven, if you do a lunge kind of and turn towards a hip, the hip that or turn away from the hip that's hurting. It, um, 
So uh, not necessarily hurting, but if that's the high side. So if you have okay. x-rays or if you know you have some kind of unleveling. I can, I can feel it when they when it like is unlevel. Yeah, so if you know, you can either stretch it yourself, yeah. which is what I would do, or you can go get it massaged. But because it's on the front of the lumbar, so they have to go through the abdomen to get to it, and it's really painful. <laughs> stretch it yourself. Yeah. But yeah, twist away from the high side. Okay. Because it's pulling that pelvis up. <laughs> Anything else? Um, three references here. The FMS is that squat um, little poster I put up. They have, I think, six to eight exercises that everyone could be tested on. Um, Tim Anderson. Find him on YouTube. He's really funny to watch him when he crawls. He kind of over exaggerates, over exaggerates what you should be doing. Uh, love his stuff, though. Love his stuff. And then uh, Heidi Havik is just a researcher that talks about uh, chiropractic and movement patterns and how they influence the brain. Cool stuff. That's it. Awesome.